get by It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a beach If you find the same like right now I feel like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. And Craig, I always like to mention some past guest episodes. You know, since we're, this is kind of in the realm of a lot of digital agencies use Craig's um, platform and company. Uh, So I was like, who else have I had on? I've had um, Jason Swank on. He runs a a big group and helps uh, digital agencies. You can check that episode out. Um, I had Wes Matthews, who talked about growing his agency to six and a half million dollars and then selling it and staying on and just doing what he loves to do. So there's a lot more um, podcasts. Also, I wanted to give a shout out to some other people in the industry who I know, Todd Tasky from Potomac Business Capital, who basically helps agencies sell their business. Um, and Duncan Allen, who's a master of social media, Firebelly Marketing, and Drew Hendricks, who specializes in wineries and winery suppliers at Barrels Ahead. Craig, I always like, there's so many different (laughs) niches that people serve and you probably get this. So I'm gonna introduce you formally in a second and also uh, Chalk Digital. But before I do, this episode is brought to you by Rise25. And what we do is we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships by helping you run your podcast. And, you know, for me, Craig, it's always the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my relationships and profile them and the companies and people I admire. And I've done that over the past decade, over decade, by having them on my podcast. So I tell everyone, just like you should have a website for your business, you should have a podcast. And not only does it you know, allow you to you know, really profile their people, it builds content. You know, If you ask me to write a post, Craig, I, it would take me five years. Like I will not do it, but I will (laughs) be able to talk. And I've been publishing almost two episodes a week for almost 10 years. And you can do that through a podcast. So if you've ever thought of doing a podcast, I think you should, but um, you could always email me with questions or us. You can go to rise25.com and learn more. I'm excited for today's guest, Craig Hagopian. And he started Chalk Digital in 2013 to democratize local advertising and he's been doing this for decades. I don't want to age you, Craig, or anything, but <laughs> you really help pioneer location-based advertising as a service solution. And yeah. what Chalk does is they power advertising solutions. They're able to launch a campaign anywhere in the world in, I don't want to quote, but like less than seven minutes from start to finish. And that's from national brands, local businesses, and it helps automate local display video connecting TV advertising all in one. And he's been doing this for 30 years in technology (laughs) and sales and consumer service marketing experience. And Craig, uh, thanks for joining me. Ah, my pleasure. And you did a great job of thumbnailing me. Yep. You you nailed me probably over 30 years. (laughs) Good. Yeah. I mean, it's it's pretty amazing. We'll go back to one of the stories of a past company too, that you founded, but let's start with chalk um, for a second. And um, where does it come from? How did you come up with this idea? Yeah, that's, that's such a great question. I actually, uh, I can kind of answer two questions at once here for you. Uh, I was actually the co-founder of Ground Truth, XAD, um, and we were in San Francisco and we were having a business meeting on the, on the outside of uh, Embarcadero and a shopkeeper's out there uh, putting together his little sandwich sign board for the daily special. And we're watching them and it probably took 15 minutes to do it. And, and then I said, wow, how many people are going to actually see that sign? And most people had their heads in the phones anyway, walking around. So they're not going to even see the sign anyway. And I said, wouldn't it be cool if they could just take a picture of that and broadcast it to a thousand people instead of just a few hundred. And that was the birth of chalk because of the chalkboard and digital is new school. So it's kind of a combination of old school and new school. And that's been kind of the democratization of what we've been doing. And we found that not only does an individual business care about that, but agencies can really sink their teeth into that kind of a capability. And so our whole platform today is is for an agency to use these tools we've built for real-time advertising or real-time location-based marketing and and, and business um, outreach. 
Yeah, Craig, I want to hear about, I want you know, we'll dig deep on use cases because people sure. love hearing use cases, but you know, it's famous last words, I guess, of an entrepreneur is like, what if, <laughs> and you know, whatever you're about to say, you're going to spend countless hours and, you know, sleepless yeah. nights. What made you decide when you thought of that, that this was a something that you actually should execute on? Because I'm sure there's a lot of stuff that you think about and there's a lot of stuff you're bit you're busy at the time too. What, what were you, why did you decide to move wow. forward and do it? What a, what a great question. Um, I've never been asked it that way. So I'll give you the answer that um, that's clearly what, what drove it. So at the time we were at Ground Truth X, uh, XAD, which is a more of a traditional technology platform heavy on salespeople who work with agencies to run a campaign. And we were always confronted with having enough staff and enough operations, and it's very expensive to set that up. And so when I saw that chalkboard and I thought, well, everybody's posting today, like everybody should have a podcast. Well, everybody should be posting and creating content for social media. And 100%. today everybody can do that. So I said, what if we took those two pieces and put them together? And that's really what the birth was about. We even we have an app today that you can actually take a photo of anything, uh, a mug, a cup, and broadcast it to hundreds of people. In fact, we just finished working with Dog TV, and Dog TV is a channel for pets, not for humans. Uh, so when you <laughs> when you go away and your dog will sometimes get anxiety because their masters or the family is gone, uh, they'll kind of start to you know act you know crazy and maybe chew on something. And so dog TV, actually, you put it on and it pacifies them and it makes them really? feel good. And it, it's, I blurred no idea. To their, it's blurred to their eyes. I mean, you and I watch that TV. <laughs> it looks a little off and the colors are weird, but for a dog, it's beautiful. Um, and so what we did with the dog TV kind of side there, what we did with dog TV is we built an app using our platform and we're giving it to all the local shelters in the United States so they can take a picture of a pet and broadcast it to a thousand families nearby all free of service because it's our social give back has been you know a pet adoption and so it's really neat because what happens is you know people who have no technology background i mean not to pick on shelters but you know the the the, the pet loving people that run shelters are not usually your most technically advanced folks and they get this app they put it on their phone android or apple they can take a photo of the dog add a couple things about, you know, where, where the dog is, how old it is, what its name is, and then that creates the ad. And then we take it into our system in real time and, and throw it out to, you know, nearby households. And it's a great way to accelerate getting the, the pets into great homes. And it's good for the dogs and it's great for the shelter. And it's obviously good, good for humans to have animals around. I'm a big believer in that. So anyway, that's awesome. That, that's just kind of an aside, but also the whole vision of what we were trying to work on. And still, we're not done. Uh, you yeah. know, I've been working on this since 2013. I'll probably be doing this in 2023, a decade from then. And it's all about just continuing to refine and, and make that process easier and, um, and more powerful. As anyone that's on, who's listening to your podcast today, especially an agency, they know how difficult local advertising is. It's hard to set up. It's hard to get some scoring. It's hard to get, you know, results sometimes, especially when you're talking about offline or linear things. And so my big believer is that, you know, you need to combine both online and offline to make the best program. And so hopefully we give those tools to a agency who's you know, supporting their clients. Yeah, we'll talk about some of the business applications. And I love the, the component of offline, online, online, offline. But you mentioned the, the dog channel, the dog TV. There is <laughs> I was, when I was doing research about Chalk Digital, there is, um, you know, people have used it for lost dogs for neighborhoods. Right. And so, right. you know, instead of putting like you picture that picture of the dog on like the telephone poles everywhere, <laughs> which is kind of like me? chalk digital, <laughs> right? Like you, people have used it for that application as well. Totally. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It works both ways. I think it's, it's for us, it's always been, let's go to where we have an organized group of people who we can actually educate or, you know, get them in their hands. It's harder when it's what we call C to C, consumer to consumer, because then I have to educate an individual consumer and in how to download the app. It's all easy to do. It's just, you know, it's it's very what I call fragmented. Yes, totally. So we've totally. got we've always gone where one one webinar with 30 agencies at once all you know spread the the capabilities in a much faster way. Yeah. But absolutely it does work for what I call yeah. consumer to consumer. Personal yeah. advertising. 
Yeah, I mean, it's interesting the different applications because even with Groupon, like Groupon, when it, you know, it was the point mm -hmm. and it started off as like just trying to gather large people for advocating for moving that parking meter or whatever. And, and there's so many different applications and obviously same thing with with chalk, right? Yep. Um, so before we get into the, the business applications, X ad. OK, mm -hmm. so if people don't know what X ad is, it's it was, you know, two, established in 2009, the largest mobile local advertising network in the U.S. and offered targeted search display and in a lot of other things, probably billions of business listings um, and requests every month and everything like that. So take me back to XAD for a second, and because there was some personal stuff that went on with XAD that I think would be interesting to talk about. Yeah, uh, it definitely was. Going back to the original discussion about where did Chalk come around, I was in San Francisco at that time, as I mentioned. I was also the co-founder of, of XAD, which now today is called Ground Truth. And we were growing just enormously. And in this space, you really need to be anchored in New York. San Francisco is great. It's, a, it's, it's the mega city for advertising and, and, and you know, growing businesses on the West Coast but you've got to have an East Coast presence. And so it was a, a decision made by the team that we need to move our business to New York. And I was one of the older guys on the team with a family and to move uh, nothing against New York or you know, living in New York, but just at that time, it was a really hard thing to do. And so I had to actually kind of parachute out. And it's a really difficult thing to kind of give up one of your babies to move across the country. And so that actually, you know, was a, a good upper, good thing for my family because you know I was traveling constantly anyway, and probably if I kept on that path, who knows? What, did, what was your have... family look like at that time with kids? Uh, what, what... Wife and two kids that were yeah. in there, like one was like nine and the other one was twelve. Yeah, right. So they, um, you would be ostracized from your family if you took them and you made them go to a different school and make new friends. Uh, and, <laughs> and not only just the move and everything else and. Right. You know, I was already commuting three, four days a week anyway, right? Traveling everywhere mm. um, and to go to New York. It's and hard. Like that. Oh, yeah, it's tough. Um, and so that's one of those forks in your life that you make a decision, but it then allowed me to take some time off and kind of reconsider what I was doing and seeing how, you know, we had built ground truth and said, well, maybe we can build a different way. And lo and behold, that all kind of moved together. But it didn't happen overnight, right? That, that year after... Uh, you know, not going with ground truth or X ad at the time to the East Coast was kind of painful. You know, there's a separation among your your colleagues and friends about what they're doing and and you're kind of uh, spinning in a different direction. And so anyway, it was great, you know, kind of self gave, gave me a, like a mid-career hiatus for a year. Um, but then I just couldn't get myself out of the ad tech world. And that's where, you know, chalk came back in. But yeah, really absolutely. Tough. You've got to do that. Craig, you know. Tell me a little bit more about the internal dialogue, Gibby, with just in your head or with your family, because I'm sure there's people right now listening who maybe are at a crossroads. They have to make a decision. And when we all have been with COVID, right? I mean, it's changed a lot of things. But yeah. um, for you, when you were starting to, it's a strain uh, personally on the family to be traveling that much, especially when you're used to being close. Um, when you came to a decision mm. to go, okay, I think I need a change. It's also tough because this is your baby. So wh what, what were the options for you in your mind of what you were going to do? Yeah. Um, so the options were, uh, you know, not to, you know, uh, separate the baby, right? We could say, well, why don't we have a, two, you know, a different organization on the West Coast or something like that. I thought that would actually kind of the old adage, right, where, you know, you have a, you have a bike uh, and two people and, you know, you, you both want to split in half. Well, then both people don't have a bike that runs. Right. And so sometimes you, somebody, you know, for the bigger love has to give up the bike and let the other person be able to ride it around. And that really was the decision for me um, is that I thought I, I cared so much about the company's success and future that for me, it was, it was the right sacrifice. Plus I had, I was blessed with a great family and I didn't want to disrupt that. And at the long term you know, work is important. Um, but I think, you know, if you look back in your, and you know, at your life and your, and your last few days and you say, wow, I, I moved my company, but then I lost my family. I don't think that would be the right thing to say. 
uh, you know, your epitaph. I think it'd be better to say I started something else or I did something else, but my family and I, you know, were together. At least for me, that was the way to look at it more long. So when you laid out the options, you could go, okay, we could do it. We could keep a branch here in San Francisco. I can run it. Um, at that point, was there an option just to be virtual? or it's just not a possible in 2012 i don't think a lot of people were thinking virtual right okay. <laughs> plus it was such an intensive face-to-face -face business still is right um and we decided that we were just gonna leave engineering there and i wasn't part of the engineering i was the sales and marketing team i had to be at the headquarters with the yeah you know, with, the, with all the sales people so it was kind of you know taking a different path um and, and i didn't want to change what i was doing um you know plus i, I don't want to be running engineering when that's not really my skill set or even, you know, we had, we had very capable people running engineering. So that wasn't in a fit. It was, it was actually, you know, maybe a blessing. The neat thing is that, you know, we had investors and we had boards that I had to, you know, we sat with everybody and we went through, you know, how do we do this? And I think actually, you know, ended up being great for them because everybody can, you know, get stronger in some ways because they're not relying always on Craig or whatever Craig was bringing or doing. So I think it was, it ended up being really great. And I love doing chalk and I, Still talk to my ground truth friends. Uh, those are still there. Um, so it, it that ended up being a blessing, I think. So yeah, so you just said, okay, it's gotta be New York. I need to be present or not at all type of thing. And then you decide, well, cause you could, I guess, also just stay on as like an advisor, um, but it sounded like, you know, how do you decide to then part? Do you go, okay, you can buy my shares because you could have probably stayed on as a, is just like a advisor too, I imagine. Yeah, I actually I did for about maybe six months or so. I had, you know, an advisorship kind of thing. And but it's it's weird where, you know, for a while they they continue to just talk to you about things, right? And because you still know what's going on, you can give some advice. But after maybe six months, if you're not in the business every day or talking to the same accounts or whatever's going on, then you lose you touch. Of, you lose touch and it yeah. and it just kind of naturally goes through an organic you know, all of a sudden the phone doesn't ring as many times as it used to or whatever it is. Um, so that kind of just takes its own path. But the interesting thing about the stock you brought up was that there's, you know, in, when you start a company, there's usually what we call founder shares, which are kind of given to you and those are kind of granted. And then as you're there for a while or you're, you know, employees that weren't part of the founding team, you'll get options. And so I had a combination of those two over the years. Um, and what I was able to do is work, and this is something maybe everybody should think about when they, you know, exit or if they, especially if they have good relationships with the management of the company, just talk about, Hey, give me six months or give me a year to make a decision about my stock. Um, heck if you, if you, you know, go, if you go public or you get bought, well, then everything's kind of easy to take care of because everything transacts and there's a change of ownership, but I'll give me a year to buy, especially when you, you know, you have a decent amount of stock that you've kind of compiled. You know, you just can't write a check, especially now when you don't have a, you know, a new salary coming in. So I asked for some time to make a decision. And therefore, let's just say there was a pot of stock and I ended up, you know, grabbing more than half of it. I just didn't get all of it because you know, there's only so much money you can try to cobble together on a shares. So that was kind of good. I I'd definitely suggest that for entrepreneurs and those that get in this situation about working with the management team, especially when you have a good relationship with them and the board and saying, hey, I don't want to do anything disruptive. I want to actually help the company out from the outside, but just give me time to make decisions about my stock. Um, and, you know, usually you'll end up returning some unless you want to buy them all, which is great too for the company, right? They get a little, they get a little liquidity off the, uh, the strike prices. But for me, it was taking some off the table and I still consider ground truth kind of like I call it my 401k. <laughs> because I still have shares there and I wish them well. And I really don't run into them in, in what I do today. We're such at a different point in how we access partners and work with them um, that, you know, I've never had anyone come up and say, okay, it's between you and ground truth. I've never heard that in a, you know, agency discussion. Um, they know that I, I have that background, which is kind of cool because it gives me some credibility instantly walking in and say, oh, you guys, you help start, you know, that company, which is really a masterful, large network. Ours is not as large, but it's based on how to get things done in an easier way. So anyway, hopefully that's kind of a, a nice anecdotal that's interesting. story about how to kind of work with your founders. Uh, and again, you know, at that time, Ground Truth had outside investors. So you had institutionals that were sitting on the board, right? So it's not like they're the most friendly um, gentlemen and ladies because they're all about the, 
the investment, but they understood the importance of the team and, and how you treat somebody like me will then reflect on the rest of the company. And they don't want to be working for a company that looks like an ogre, right? Or doesn't have compassion for people who put in years and years of service or do things right. So those are the kind of things that, you know, if you're an entrepreneur and you, you're faced with that, you need to kind of bring those to the forefront and say, hey, listen, I want to do everything I can to help the company. It's just a change in life or there's a different uh, you know, road I need to pursue. How do we work this together? And as, as soon as you get that going with your team or with a couple of keyboard people or you know, advisors, I think it really goes much smoother. Um, That's really interesting. Was, I was not even thinking about that, but ultimately they, you can, you know, a company could say, okay, well, I'm going to, I want to retain something, but then they will buy you out of whatever you don't want so that you get some, you know, kind of cushion to what your next thing is, but you also keep some of the sweat, blood and sweat and tears you poured into it and you keep that for the future. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, for most stock plans I've seen, I mean, it's not like there's some, you know, special thing. I think most companies are set up with this, you know, a, a common and some options and, and they all have uh, time basis on how long you take to make a decision. So, you know, stretch on that. Even if it says in, in your paperwork, oh, you know, you have to make a decision within 60 days of leaving the company, you know, you can sit down and talk and work with the board, especially if it's yeah. you know, a large amount of shares. And I encourage you to do that because you can also say, hey, I want to be the biggest advocate for the company and I want to help you guys grow, even though I can't be part of it every day. Um, you know, there's a lot of things I can still do. And yeah. for me, I even, you know, said I won't work uh, in your space for a year. So another reason why I kind of took my hiatus and my sabbatical mental, physical, and otherwise was to just stay out of that space for a year um, and really just separate. And it also gave me time to think about chalk and other things I wanted to do. So, you know, it's, it's not like a bad thing. It, it's actually ends up being a really healthy thing. If you can kind of um, clearly separate and have, you know, some rules about how you want to be treated after you leave. And again, I'm not saying this is for, you know, somebody who comes on board for a year, two years or a year and a half and they're, a, you know, they're a uh, uh, operational clerk. I'm not, I'm not looking at those kind of people, but yeah. for all the founders and on the call and the entrepreneurs that really are ground floor people, you have a lot more leverage than you think, um, both coming into the business and also leaving the business. Really interesting. So let's talk, thanks for sharing that. Um, yeah. it's a, it probably was a really tough decision to make it is time. actually right you know yeah. really you just you know it's one of those things but the, mo the more i do with my new business chalk the less i even think about those kind of things right for the, i'll tell you for the first year or those you know early months right after leaving ground truth or having that separation you know you go to bed thinking about that every night you know like what's going on or did i make the right decision or this is the right thing and and i can really you know i i don't think i slept well for those first two three months after that and then after after a while, you kind of get your own cadence back, and you know the compression is, is different. Um, but uh, everyone everyone will try it out. I just don't think uh, you should look at it as a as a black environment of you know what bad might happen to you. You look at it as the good things. Talk about I mean some of the um, the leadership and team at Chalk. Hmm. So when you decided to start this, and like who's involved now? Because you tend to have these companies, you build a really good team around you. So it's not just you. <laughs> yep. Uh, I can't do anything by myself, right? <laughs> uh, or at least nothing of, of great you know, importance or consequences. I, I believe that you know, teams are the foundation, especially early on with entrepreneurs. It's the team that most uh, people in, you know, bet on or invest in. Forget about the slide where or whatever you're present, presenting. It's usually 80% team is the weight that the investor makes. So to answer your question about what I did, um, I was very fortunate to have uh, a good network. Um, I did make a decision with the, the Ground Truth or XAD team that I wasn't gonna poach anybody. Even after I take my year off, I'm not here to cause issues. Um, but if somebody I knew at Ground Truth is already gone, who's left, that's fine. Nobody has an issue with that. So Fair I started game. to kind yeah. of look at that. Um, and that way, you know, you have trust, especially today where you're working virtually, um, and you, you know, you may not be seeing each other every day in the, the, the hallways or the office. You really have to, you know, I think it's a, there's a paramount importance on working with people you already know, or you have some trust with. Um, and so for me, the leadership team ended up being, uh, the, the former head of technology for ground truth. He also had, a, had a couple kids and, 
And though he could stay back in the San Francisco area and not have to worry about New York, there was, you know, there's always just kind of a divide. And so he decided on his own accord after a while that he wanted to um, make a break. And he, had, he said, Craig, I do like your vision about chalk and democratizing advertising. And so I was very blessed that I had, had the engineering horsepower very early on at chalk. And so the co-founder, Chandra Colia, who was also the head of engineering for Ground Truth, ended up being my co-founder at chalk. And that helps a great deal. Uh, the other, you know, I have a three-legged stool. The other component is a gentleman that I met back in the 90s who helped Sony get into um, a bunch of different businesses. His name is Satori Yuki. And again, going back to people you know and trust and you've done a lot of things with. And so Yuki runs all our international business, which today is actually dominant in our company. And for those that run a smaller company, you know, on your call or listening to us on a podcast, uh, you know, a lot of them just never think about outside of the country they're operating within. And um, if you can find the right partners, going global is a really smart thing. And I'll tell you uh, a real uh, case here with Chalk in the last two years. With the pandemic, you know, U.S. Uh, and still today is, you know, uh, you know, kind of jiving and moving and trying to navigate itself through COVID. Other parts of the world, especially in Asia, they're more used to these pandemics. Um, the wearing masks is not a statement of, you know, political sides either way. I don't want to get into that part of it. Um, but because we had a lot of our business outside the U.S., we, wait, we really uh, navigated through COVID and actually ended up in one of our best years in 2020 because we weren't just in one market. And therefore, if that market catches cold, <laughs> you know, you get a cold. Here, even though U.S. was down maybe 15, 25 percent, depending on the, on the sector of advertising, we didn't experience that at all in other parts of our business. And so it really helped us, you know, again, we didn't set up our business because of COVID that way. It just worked out that uh, being, you know, kind of global, even though you're a small company is uh, actually a smart thing. Yeah, I love that, Craig. And if anyone goes to chalkdigital.com, you see there is chalk Japan uh, in the dashboard. And, <laughs> and, and it is smart because mo a lot of people, I think myself included, definitely is like, we're not thinking international at all. And there's a big I, opportunity. I, I, Right. And that's also why I said to you, you can launch a campaign anywhere in the world. I have to do put a little asterisk qualifier for you this on that, Jeremy. Um, we don't run any advertising today or don't have access to North, North uh, Korea. Um, okay. <laughs> I'm not sure what I would advertise there personally, but uh... no, but most of the partners we work with, we've got global access. We have servers, uh, you know, all across the planet. Uh, in servers, uh, ed servers that allow us to you know, run advertising in all parts of the world. And which actually has ended up very kind of cool. I'll give you another anecdote. Um, we have some adver advertisers, actually real estate agents in Mexico. And obviously they do run some advertising in Mexico, but they also really want to bring down uh, folks that live in you know, the US and Canada and other parts of the world, especially when they live in these resort cities where the homes are more for you know, business travel or for families that, you know, maybe are on a different spectrum of, of purchase. And they'll actually have us run their campaigns in different parts of the world just to kind of say, hey, have you ever thought about living in this part of the world? Or look at this you know, beautiful exotic um, uh, home, which you'd never afford maybe, let's say in you know, California, right. could be very affordable in other parts of the world. I've totally seen those. Like, come no, to Wisconsin from us, or whatever. You saw those ads, yeah, those exactly. are ours. Yes. <laughs> um, Let's go through a couple business applications. I don't know if you want to share your screen because I, I, I sure. like the visual you were showing me before you hit record. And so if you want to share your screen and let walk through a couple scenarios on how yeah, I think that's people fun. use Chalk Digital. Yeah, I think it gives a little bit of um, what I call uh, visual with the audio here. Let me do the screen share um, and we'll go for it. Uh, here we go. That's perfect. All yeah. right. So I have, you know, four or five vignettes, uh, really quick little thumbnails. Um, I would say all of them had an agency component, meaning that an agency's involved in either creating the creative or they were the ones that wanted us to bring in the tool. Um, so I think everybody can relate to, you know, them being the kind of the central part of any campaign. So Wonderfront, uh, I'll just use this as the first one. And because of the nature of our campaign or our platform being so real time, you know, things like this, where you've got a live event, we're actually kind of a nice way to kind of promote it. Um, this case, because we knew about, uh, we, we had time to kind of schedule this, 
Uh, Wonderfront is a festival, probably ran 20, 30,000 people um, in, back in 2019. Obviously, 2020, it was canceled. It's going to come back on 2021. And where Chalk comes in is that we were able to, you know, they told us who they thought their customer would be or who would be as somebody likely to come to this event. Had over 100 artists, 10 stages. I mean, it took over downtown San Diego. So what we did is we flooded about a 200-mile radius around the festival grounds. And we went on apps that had a lot of music-centric, you know, like the, the Pandoras and the Spotify's. And we served based on those kinds of signals that said, you're probably, if you've got that on your phone, you're probably more likely to be interested in music and you like music. And so we use that. And then we looked at the engagement levels and because our platform is real time, we could actually collect those users. So next year or this coming year, when we do the you know, second inaugural event, we are going to go ahead and go back into our archives and pull out those consumers that we saw at the event, as well as those we reached and let them know that uh, Wonderfront's back on, back on stage. So it's kind of an interesting use case. Closer to home, maybe not as big in scope, but you know, local restaurants, um, especially today where you know, a lot of people don't know, hey, is my restaurant open yet or not? Um, we're really Back to the about... roots of Chalk Digital. Exactly right. That, 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 that was probably the, <laughs> the, the root of it was that, that, that sign, the chalkboard with the daily special. Here, we actually partnered with a FSI company, meaning a uh, standalone insertion company that did, you know, like a printed flyer to homes. And so we took their printed flyer, made mm -hmm. it into an ad unit. And so now in a neighborhood where you're canvassing, you know, hundreds of homes, you're not only reaching them digitally, but you're also reaching them on print. And I'm a big omni-channel believer. I don't believe digital is better than legacy, you know, offline. I think both of them together, you, they make them work better together. And so here, because they, they had a flyer uh, being delivered, you know, to the residents of, right? And then we were able to overlay that with our channel. You got really good for 14,000 impressions on top of the delivery. And we were only like 5% of the spin, right? Because the print is much more expensive than 14,000 ads. We drove great engagement, which in our world we call CTR or click-through rates of 78, uh, which is half a percent. That's really good. And then we got a lot of secondary actions and coupons were downloaded and phone calls and allowed them to introduce that they're, you know, they were a brand new restaurant in the area. And obviously I do recommend that, you know, have a compelling offer. And you can see here that it was a free lunch buffet. Um, that's compelling. That's pretty good, right? Uh, I think the <laughs> idea was that you had to go in there, buy a lunch, you'll get a lunch for free. Right. But again, that's how they did the execution. So it's, it's kind of a neat way to do it. Uh, really quickly, to, Craig, oh, sure. on, that, on that example, um, so sure. your platform and you can take the, uh, that physical data and make it and serve up digitally? Yep. Yeah. So two things we do to kind of translate that offline or that physical world to the digital virtual world is that we can take the creative, lift the key aspects and the look and the color and whatever the photos are, because that way you're being consistent about your, you know, your messaging and your branding across the offline and the online. So that's the first thing we do. The second is we'll ask you, well, where are you serving today? Um, you know, maybe you can actually show me your zip code list or your mail list or whatever it is. We'll bring that in and then we'll, we'll match that list to a digital um, household level. And so we're actually overlaying um, our digital in the same homes that you're trying to serve physical. And I'll just give you some examples. What happens is if you did one or the other by themselves, they're both going to be fine. But when you put them together, there's this kind of a, 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 a more of a air and ground uh, attack. Um, and they both do a much better job. And what we find is the homes that only get one piece, um, let's just say it does X. But what we find is if you do both, you get X plus 0.3. So you get a 30% bump when you, you kind of bring them both together. So things to think about, you know, uh, you know, agencies is how do you coordinate different medias together is really key. And we, we, we think our platform helps you do that. Oh yeah. I mean, with any marketing, I don't know what the stats are. I've heard various things. You need, people need to see something five to 10 times before they take an action. So the more we see it, especially then there's more credibility because you're like, well, I'm seeing them everywhere. They're on my phone. I'm getting the mailer <laughs> and you feel like there's more credibility there as well. So totally. no, I love, I love the, the multi-channel. And, and I think also all of us consume 
uh, content in different ways, right? Um, if I'm in a household, there might be some people who do pick up the mail and they're the one that will maybe see that flyer, but the rest of the family didn't see that flyer, right? So, and you know, other people in the home might see the digital and not the other way around. So it, it's really smart to kind of combine the two or yeah. combine three or four. Love it. So yep. what was the next one? Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, so next one is, a, is a kind of a, again, still very local in nature. That's one of the, the core pieces of our company is that we like to have a local component though we've run national campaigns for folks. At the end of the day, we all think that everything's still local at some level. Um, here, what we've done is we've built a whole suite of ads. Um, they're templates for Berkshire agents. And so when they log in, we already know what their, their headshot looks like. We already know all the specifics about them. So when they go to launch a campaign, 90% of that campaign is already built before they even did anything. And all they need to do is kind of paint or enter the location they want this ad to run in like maybe it's a farming territory or you know, it's consistent with a mail list again. And these just overlay. And then we give them a dashboard. It gives them all the reporting. And so it's, it's kind of what we call a, a franchise um, use of our platform. So any agency that's working with a franchise, they're always trying to figure out, well, I can work with you know, corporate on the national campaign, but how do I you know, help the rest of the network out? And so we actually can help them bridge those kind of that's solutions cool. by giving them a tool that they can actually give to their client, leveraging the creative they did for corporate. And now it's kind of a brand consistent kind of game because as you know, real estate agents, or maybe you don't know, but real estate agents, even though they might have a business card that says Berkshire or Coldwell or whatever they say, they're still really independent um, operators. And so there's only so much that the brand can do. They can, they can say, hey, please use my tool and please don't mess up my logo and please use the right color. But at the end of the day, if an agent goes down the street to one of their friends to run a an ad and they kind of squish the ad or they screw it up, it's running. It's still so representing. This, it's still company. representing. So, you know, the brands are kind of always perplexed about how do I keep my brand consistent, which helps everybody, but also allow them to have their own autonomy. And so our platform, I think, walks that fine line where it's been set up by the, the brand uh, folks and the marketing people. So they know it's going to look great. And you can see here, it's even in different languages. So they don't have to be an expert. If they want to run a, a campaign in a different part of the world, they can. And so, you know, this is a, a really good example of how we kind of go in at a very high level, but also it, it, it waterfalls down to the local agent to run their own business. Yeah. I cool. guess the question I have with that is who's using the platform? Um, so an agency could use it for franchises and do and the real estate clients. companies sometimes come on and use it or would the individual, would some of the individual real estate people use it or at what level is it? Okay, no, it, no, Jeremy, yeah. it's the agency and the <laughs> and the larger company and the real individual real estate people are yeah. really not using it on that level. Who's who's, able, yeah, who's using it, typically so, using it? So, for I'll answer the question at the, at the highest level, and then I'll give you exactly how the Berkshire piece is doing it. So, in Chalk, we have a, a platform that it's actually comes in two different flavors. One for an agency, where they have it's there. It's a centralized platform just for them, and all their clients live in there. And they can actually open up any client they want and do the work they need to do. The other product we have is an enterprise product, which we then drop into a, a company like Berkshire, where the sell-in is to the company, the, the corporate entity, and we set everything up and we make it walk and talk the way they want. It goes inside of their toolbox for you know where their commission checks are and where all the other tools are. There's a button that says chalk on it. Um, and therefore, it's been set up for by corporate, but it's for the individual agent to operate it. So it's, it's been dumbed down. Like the way the workflow works is very simple. Like a, a you know, a, I say a fifth grader could read and understand what the screens are trying to do so that you don't have to be an expert. The agency product or platform, very sophisticated, or, you know, we dial it up and allow them to have a lot more tools because this is their business and they understand it. And so you'll see a lot of you know, a lot more levers and buttons, and it's a lot more technical. I would never try to have an agent or any small business get interfaced with the agency product. It's just overwhelming, um, not, not because it's technical or hard. It's just, it's, it's, you know, giving them things that only an agency can appreciate. Yeah. Um, so anyway, that's the way we go to market. So we, in this scenario, we actually have two customers. I've got corporate who's set the table. I work with them and we actually do some things for them that, you know, at a corporate level too, but the real um, bulk of the business is allowing, you know, the 50,000 agents plus in the United States and brokers have tool access to their own tools. I love it. 
Craig, um, I think we have time for one more case study. Okay. So I'd love you to share it. And I just want to point people towards chalkdigital.com. Check it out. Um, this has been great. Craig, I really appreciate you, your time and sharing all of this. Yep. What's the last one we should, last we one should take people going, home with? Okay. This one yeah. is to me actually the perfect uh, full circle of the beginning of chalk, which I mentioned to you, like take a photo of something like a chalkboard on the front of your business and propagate it out. So we're working with a <clears throat> huge recruiting firm, uh, top three in Asia. And this is not the recruiting firm that maybe all of us on this, on this podcast would want, meaning an executive recruiting firm trying to find your job. This is actually a team of about a thousand salespeople that goes door to door to local businesses and says, oh, I need a cashier. I need a clerk. I need a wait staff. Uh, your, your hourly seasonal uh, part-time workers. It's a very different market. And what they do is they go in there with their phone and they can actually take a live photo of the business or the team. And these ads, you can see that, you know, you probably can't read them all, but these ads are basically saying, come join us, come work for us. And some actually even say it's $12 an hour um, and it's flexible time. And what we're doing is because the business is actually trying to find these staffs, we're putting a very tight, what I call circles or bubbles around these businesses because it's doing two things. One is letting local people know, hey, if I need a part-time job, I'm not gonna go across the country for a part-time job, right? I can't even get there transportation-wise. This is local, part-time, and on top of it, it also, if, if you're not interested in the job, it makes you think about that business again, and you think about them. And, and so it's actually doing a little bit of double duty. It's helping the business grow by promoting its product or service, because usually you've got a picture of whatever you're selling in there, you know, like the sandwich or the food or whatever, but you're also letting people know, hey, we're growing, we need staff. It does uh, double I'm duty. In. Double duty. So this is a perfect, you know, I couldn't have dreamed of a better use of chalk, which is it's local, um, you can personalize it. Some of the, like the McDonald's one here in the middle, you can see that's a corporate stock photo, which is fine. We allow you to put that in. But the other ones, and um, so, so is Mossberger in the bottom. But the other three um, are Donkey at the top, uh, Amazon and Costco. Those are real live photos. Those are actual, you know, authentic photos of the team and the business saying, come on in and work for us. And I think that's a really kind of a powerful story about how local advertising kind of bonds you with your community. So anyway, that's what we're doing here. And this is, a, I think, hopefully a, a nice one to kind of put a cherry in the top for where we've been and what we've done. And, and here's a, a large company using us both at a, at a corporate level, but also at the local ground level, you know, trying to find jobs for people today, which is a huge thing because of all the disruption from uh, the last year. Craig, I want to be the first one to thank you. Everyone check out chalkdigital.com. Check out more episodes of the podcast. Check out Rise 25. And Craig, thank you so much. Hey, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, love to follow up with anybody who has questions and love your podcast. I think you've convinced me I need to do one of these every couple of weeks. 100%. Our so buddies. people thank can you. contact you through chalkdigital.com through contact us. Are there and any I, other better places? I, and, and actually I'll, I'll, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm an open, uh, open book here. Just reach out to me at Craig at chalkdigital.com. That's my email. Cool. Happy to follow up with any of your, uh, your audience and your, um, your business. Cool. Thanks Craig. Thanks buddy. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. Like a beach if you find the sand right now I feel like a hunt